Well, good morning again, everybody. What I'd like to do this morning is just embark on a, a sort of a mini series. I've called it the Major Profits for Dummies. Um, you know, after the way that the the world often writes books, you know, it might be Computers for Dummies or Microsoft for Dummies. Just a sort of a, a, a tongue-in-cheek way of saying, well, we're going to give you the basics for, for anyone who's really a bit ignorant of these things and, and set you on the right way. And this was prompted actually by a request from Sister Candice, just wanting to understand a little bit more about what the prophets were about, particularly Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, so the, those three major ones. And I've got to admit, um, my heart leaps when, when people request things like that, um, to want to understand more. And the reality is, I believe it's an important principle to have a, a summary foundation understanding of something before you can actually build on the detail. In other words, in, in relation to this subject, it's good just to understand you know, the, the basic principles about the books before you can actually go into all the little nitty gritty word by word details of it. Because if you don't understand the essential overview, then you can sometimes be led off on tangents on, on little minor points. So first of all, we're going to start with the prophet Isaiah. Who, who was Isaiah and what timeline does his book cover? Um, another <coughs> reason why for me that this is special is because I grew up in a, a mainline church that ha had regarded the Old Testament as finished, done, over, um, that was all about the Jews. The Jews blew it. And now we're living in New Testament times with Jesus. The Old Testament means nothing. So there was very little emphasis on the Old Testament at all. And although as a youngster, it didn't really mean much to me, didn't really know much, when I got converted and came to realise that actually the old and the new, they dovetail, Jesus basically quotes pretty much everything he teaches from the Old Testament and the Old Testament still has a lot of stuff yet actually to be fulfilled and it's all one big package. Um, I, I gotta admit, even to this day, after 42 years, the Old Testament still sways me. Uh, yeah, the New Testament as we call it, it's great, fantastic. But if I had to make a choice, I would always be swaying back towards the Old Testament and some of those amazing stories of God, um, his, his law, and, and of course the prophets that were in this morning. So Isaiah, who was he? Well, he was a prophet of God, and he prophesied around the time of 740 to 700 BC. So a period of about 40 years. And we're told in chapter 1 that he prophesied during the times of the kings of Judah, specifically Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Isaiah's name means Yah, or God, has saved. And when you bear in mind the message that he brings to, to Israel during his prophecy, he very much lives up to his name, bringing lots of uh, prophecies about God's salvation. Now, what was the overall thrust of Isaiah's message? Well, as with all the prophets, they were generally used by God to warn and correct Israel and bring them back to God. Uh, you know, the prophets really didn't need to speak if a king was righteous. They were still there, for sure, but you didn't actually hear a lot from them because the king was serving God. They very much then just performed a, a supporting role, just advising the king, um, obviously hearing from the word of God, as opposed to very much a strong warning and, correct, and correcting message. You'll note, you know, as you go through um, some of the stories of the men of God, like Daniel and Joseph, etc., they actually essentially were prophets. Rather than getting told by a prophet, they were um, prophets who heard from God, heard from the angels of God, and were sent um, by God to bring the, the message to those around them. In Isaiah chapter 1, 
This is sort of a, a good summary of Isaiah's message from verse 3. He says to Israel, the ox knows its owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider, ah, sinful nation, O people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. They are gone away backward. So you know, this is basically the thrust of Isaiah's message to say to Israel, listen, God made you. He owns you. He's your father. He's your maker. You don't even know who he is. You've strayed so far. And one of the beautiful verses in Isaiah, and it's in the same chapter, chapter 1, verse 18, God says through the prophet Isaiah, he says to Israel, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And I'm going to talk a little bit more um, shortly, hopefully, about the character of God. But doesn't that just scream out? about the character of God. Here's Israel, who for many years have adulterated against their God, gone after idols, done all manner of abominations before the Lord. And he's sending his prophet Isaiah to rebuke them, to warn them, but he still condescends to say to them, come, let's reason together. You know, God could have rightly said, listen, you lot, smack gone like, like he was going to do, remember, in Moses' day. You know, he said to Moses, stand aside, these bunch of rebels, I'm, I'm going to make a new nation. He could have, could have done that. But he says, no, come, let us reason together. And I like your prayer, Alan, the way you were likening ourselves. We, we are essentially the modern day Israel. We've been grafted in to the Jewish hope given to Abraham. Yes, we're Gentiles, but so was Ruth. You know, so was Caleb, so was Rahab, Gentiles, who were grafted in in Old Testament times to that, to that Jewish hope. So the same warnings, the same promises are ours, and we also do well to take heed. And for us also, when we step out of line, when we sin, God says to us, come, come on, let's reason together. Let's sit down and discuss this path you're on, and let me help you see reason. Now, not only does Isaiah and the other prophets come to warn and to rebuke Israel, but there's very much a, a, a second prong in their ministry, and that is to give some amazing prophecies of the coming Messiah and his second coming in his kingdom. So you've, you've essentially got these, these two ministries going on with the prophets. They're rebuking and warning to the present um, condition, but they're also speaking many things from God about what the future holds. Amazing, isn't it? So what are some of the examples of the prophecies concerning the Messiah? Well, we know that at least 14 times, and Alan might be able to sort of add or correct me on that. I went through um, the book of Matthew, which, which is obviously the sort of, I think, the biggest gospel record, and just went through how many times I could find direct, direct quotes from the book of Isaiah. And I counted at least 14 times quoted there. And of course, the Apostle Paul, in his writings as well, he also many times quotes um, from the book of Isaiah. So very much, very much forms part of not only Jesus' teaching, but New Testament teaching um, in relation to the Messiah. Isaiah 11, of course, is one of those ones we know, often quoted at Christmas, how the, the virgin, you know, shall give birth. Isaiah 53, and uh, that's very much a key one in relation to the Messiah, how he would suffer and, you know, be regarded um, by the people as, as nothing, and how he would bear our sins. And Isaiah 61, and Jesus actually quotes this in the synagogue um, one day about how he is going to bring the good, the good news. 
So those very much talk about his first coming, and there are also many examples in Isaiah uh, prophecies of Jesus' second coming. In fact, much more emphasis on that. Isaiah chapter 2, again, we, we know this well, about how the law shall go forth from Zion and men. There'll be no more, no more war anymore and men will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and they will learn war no more. Isaiah 11, which I know is one that um, Ruth shared with Janet way back when Janet first got converted, talking about the kingdom era when even the animals, you know, as, as now, the whole of creation groans, doesn't it? You know, it's not just us in our sinful state. The whole of creation is groaning because of what man has done. And in the kingdom age, the whole of creation as well is going to be blessed by the Messiah reigning. And Isaiah 11 gives those wonderful prophecies about how even things will be changed in the animal kingdom. The lion, as we know it today, is a, is a hunter. It's a carnivore. It kills it eats. But in the kingdom age, it's going to become a herbivore because it says, you know, the lion will eat, eat straw or herbage. And a little child will be able to play at the den of, a, of an asp, of a poisonous snake. Won't harm it. And it talks about how the wolf will lie down with the lamb. You know, normally, huh, yes, the lamb might get to lie down with the wolf, but it'll be lying down very much dead or half devoured. But no, they'll be at peace. And how a little boy will be able to lead these animals around. Ah, oh, fantastic. What a wonderful picture of the coming kingdom. If you carry on all through the book of Isaiah, there are many prophecies like this. Chapter 24 through to chapter 27 talks a lot of detail as well. Isaiah 65 talks about the new heavens and the new earth that Peter quotes in 2 Peter 3. Again, just showing that creation the whole of creation is going to be changed, restored. In Isaiah 42 verse 1, it says there, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break. The smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the islands shall wait for his law. So there's another beautiful scripture in Isaiah just talking about this coming kingdom and how the one to whom this is referring to, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall not be discouraged or fail until all of these things be fulfilled. So... These kingdom prophecies, and, and, and there's a lot in, in Isaiah, what do they tell us about the nature of God's kingdom? You know, if maybe you're reading these prophecies for the first time and you're thinking about the kingdom and wanting to know where it is and, and you know, the details of it. Well, what do these prophecies tell us? Well, fundamentally, the first thing they tell us is that the kingdom of God is going to be on earth not up in heaven. Yes, Christians will point out that Jesus said, um, you know, my reward is in heaven. Yes, it's called the kingdom of heaven. But guess what? Jesus brings it, doesn't he? The scripture that says, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. So we don't have to go and get it. Jesus is bringing it to the earth. And as I said in Isaiah 2, it talks about how in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house, where was that? That's Zion, that's Jerusalem, in Israel, it shall be established and exalted and all nations shall flow into it. Many people shall go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths for out of Zion, where was Zion? On earth shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge among the nations. So if he's going to judge among the nations, are the nations going to heaven? No, of course, they're going to be on earth. The mortal population during that thousand year reign that the immortal saints with Christ will reign over. And etc. goes on to talk, as we've said, about the swords 
being um, beaten, in other words, the um, instruments of war being turned into in instruments of horticulture and productivity. In Isaiah 11, also verse 16, it says there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people which shall be left. Uh, that word remnant is quite a sad word really and it indicates, as other scriptures do, that Israel is in for a hard time yet. A um, couple of major invasions, at least a third of Israel being destroyed, so it's going to be whittled down to what is referred to here as a remnant. Paul picks up on that as well in the book, the book of Romans. It says, A remnant shall be left from Assyria like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. And in Isaiah 19, it talks about this highway between Assyria, that's what we call today Iran, Iraq, which of course is a, a major enemy and, and arguably leading this, this latest conflict, supporting this, this latest conflict between Assyria, Iran, Iraq and Egypt, which of course historically and again will be that dragon power that will invade Israel with her, her confederates as well, and Israel. And it talks about all of those parties who at the moment are at war, how there'll be a highway linking them together, constant passage going on between them, and that they will all be regarded as the people of God. This is the time of peace that the Bible refers to. You know, in that, that scripture in Isaiah 65, that I referred to earlier about the new heavens and the new earth, it talks about how the mortal population will live much longer, just as they did, you know, in the time of the um, original patriarchs, back in the like of, likes of Noah's day and um, Shem and Noah and all that, they lived, they lived hundreds of years. And it says if someone dies being 100 years old, that will be as if they are a child. That will be a curse to die that young. So again, the mortals, again, because of the kingdom on earth and the effect that will have, they will live much longer. Now let's just think about this kingdom a, a little more. So what is a kingdom? What does it consist of? Well, you always get a ruler in a kingdom. You always, if you've got a kingdom, you've got to have somebody for the ruler to rule over. So you've got the subjects that are ruled over. You've got a, a country, a land base that forms the kingdom. You'll always have laws and, and edicts that help everyone keep in order. You'll have a banner or a flag that the country um, rallies under. You'll have a capital city where normally the seat of government or the throne for that kingdom is. And you know, when you read about the kingdom of God that's coming to earth, it has all of those constituents. Every single one are there. So, you know, going through the book of Isaiah, it's a big book. There's a lot of chapters in it. Many great scriptures about the coming kingdom, etc. If I was to select some that are good representatives of the overall message, well, I was almost going to say that would be an impossible task because there's so many good ones. But I've forced myself to choose a few. And I'm going to start with what should be number one on our list, Isaiah 58, verse 12. That's our banner, CRC. That's why we're called the Christian Restoration Center. Because in Isaiah 58, verse 12, God, speaking through Isaiah, is saying to Israel, listen, if you get back to me, if you honor me, if you keep my rules, and he, and he lists all those things, you shall be called the repairer of, of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. And I was just sharing with a lady yesterday when we went down to, to Wellington, who, who's a Christian, but sharing about our church, telling her why we're called what we call the Restoration Centre. And I said our, our mission being restorers it really is twofold. Firstly, we're seeking to restore amongst an unbelieving and atheistic world the fact that the Bible can be trusted, and that there is evidence for God in his word, some of these amazing prophecies, for example. And secondly, we're seeking to restore a lot of the mistruth, a lot of the vain human tradition 
that has crept in to Christendom. And you know, there's a, there's a big list of that, and we, we discussed a few of those which she actually identified. She'd, she'd very much seen herself. So people, we are the Restoration Centre, and our banner, our founding scripture, is in Isaiah 58, verse 12. So that's, that's pretty special. Isaiah chapter 1 that I read to you earlier about God wanting to reason together. I think that just displays in that one verse the nature of God right, right there. Isaiah 11, we've also discussed that about the animal peace, especially in relation to the way currently you know, our world really is, is groaning. Here's one from Isaiah 54 verse 17 that says, No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. So if you want a scripture to take home today to encourage you for the next wee while, that's a good one. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. But of course it's predicated on us having, as it finishes, the righteousness of God. Isaiah 56 is another good one. It says, Let no foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from his people. You know, in a sense, we're foreigners. We're Gentiles. We were astray from the commonwealth of Israel. We weren't included back in the day. And we might be thinking, Oh, maybe as a foreigner, you know, as an outsider, you know, I, I won't qualify. Well, this is, this is for us. Don't, don't say that. Furthermore, let no eunuch say, look, I'm just a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, to the eunuchs who observe my Sabbaths, who keep my law, who choose the things that please me, and who hold fast my covenant, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. And to the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, to bless the Lord's name, observing the Sabbath without profaning it, and to hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will rise up to be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for everyone. This is what the Lord God says, the one who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I'll gather still others to them besides those already gathered. And it's a reference in, in prophecy to the Gentiles being brought in to that fold. So, you know, if some of you are thinking, I'm a bit barren, maybe physically, never had children from that point of view, or even spiritual, spiritually feeling, you know, I'm not very fruitful. As long as you do those things mentioned in those verses, you hold on to the principles of God. God says, listen, however fruitful you are now, it's nothing. I'm going to put you in my house and it's going to be like you had sons and daughters coming out your ears. The blessing is going to be that much. And finally, just in, in this part of the, 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 the consideration, choosing a scripture which sort of is representative of Isaiah. And like, like I say, there's many of them. I've chosen this one as well. Isaiah 43, 9 to 11. It says, Let all the nations be gathered together. Let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may justify it, or let them hear and say, it is truth. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, my servant in whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no saviour. I love that scripture because it lays a major foundation for what we call apologetics. Uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer to me because, you know, when you apologize, it's like, oh, I'm sorry I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm sorry there's evidence. It's what it sort of sounds like, but actually it, the word apology, it, it comes from Latin or Greek. It just means to give a defense. All right? 
So when we talk about apologetics, we're talking about defending the Word of God, showing evidence that it is in fact the Word of God. And this scripture that we've just read is a fundamental foundation for that. Because what God is doing here, and, and if you can imagine a courtroom scene where you've got an accused, it's God in, in this particular case, you know, the people are saying, well, there's others, other gods and there's you. Well, why are you the God that we should follow, right? So he's the one accused. And God says, listen, I'm going to bring my witnesses. Just like in a courtroom scene, um, an accused would bring witnesses to declare his innocence. And he chooses Israel. He says, you are my witnesses that I am God. And then what he does through the prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, other, other places, he predicts, and he'd actually already done it with Moses even before this, about 1500 BC, when he said, here's my law, obey me, I'll bless you, disobey me, I'll curse you. And some of those curses will be that you'll be scattered, you'll become a proverb and a byword, you'll be hated. <laughs> See that even today with, with Israel that's still astray. He prophesies their future. He says, you'll actually end up being scattered, but not because of your righteousness. I will bring you back from your land. I will restore you. I will bless you. We'll, we'll rebuild a temple, which would ultimately um, be desecrated by the man of sin, and then I'll send my Messiah. And that's a summary of the main points. There's a lot more in there. But God chooses Israel as his witnesses, declares the future for them, and then says... To all the other rival gods, you do the same. Put up, as we would say, put up or shut up. Bring your witnesses or have the courage to say, wow, it is truth. You know, I find it so frustrating because this sort of evidence, it's so convincing. You cannot argue with history. But how many times have we shared with this with people? They've got no argument, but they continue on their merry way in the way of the world and don't have the courage and the honesty to say as God challenges them to to say wow it is truth and if it is truth there is import in that you, you can't just say oh yeah well the Bible's true disappear you've got to say well the Bible's true Yahweh is the one and only true God he is my maker he does own me wow guess what I've got to do something about that. I've got to bow my knee to him. I've got to live the way he wants me to live. So I like that scripture. And to me, it's very much representative of the writings of the prophet Isaiah. So what can we take personally from the book of Isaiah? Obviously, the wonder of all these amazing prophecies um, they affect our lives. For a lot of us, it's, that's why we're here today. That's why we chose to follow the Lord. But just on a, on a more devotional, personal level, what can we take from the book of Isaiah? Well, I heard this phrase in relation to the Bible in general that I really like. And it, it talked about, you know, when you consider the Bible and the scriptures, you should ask, ask yourself two questions. Firstly, what does it mean? And secondly, what does it mean for me? Because God's word, the book of Isaiah that we're looking at specifically here, although targeted at Israel in its day, it covers the whole of human history right up to the second coming and the kingdom of God, which includes us. So it's for us today. Well, as we've seen from chapter 1, God is very much a condescending God. You know, chapter 1 launches into Israel's sin. But, you know, God doesn't dwell on that because he very quickly in chapter 2 launches into the prophecies and the, the future kingdom prophecies which give hope. And most of the book of Isaiah is spent actually on that. And this, for me, is representative very much of the pattern of God, the way he works. He gives a rule. Man breaks it. That's inevitable. 
God then exposes man's sin, shows him the way of restoration, and gives him light of hope for the future. You know, you can go right back to Genesis chapter 2 and you can see this pattern playing out as well. God creates Adam and Eve. He gives them a commandment. Guess what? They break it. But then what happens? God covers their sin. And even in chapter 3, the very next chapter, after man has broken God's command, God brings covering. You know, he covers them with skins and he gives them hope. He brings forth that wonderful prophecy of how the woman's seed, referring to a specific person, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would one day bruise the serpent's head. In other words, destroy, give a fatal blow to sin, which is what the serpent um, has come to represent. So there's that pattern of God. God gives a command, man breaks it, God exposes their sin, then he covers our sin and gives us hope for the future. You see, God is such an amazing God. He's a righteous God, yes. And many times as you read through the scriptures, you will see his judgment fall. But as you read through the scriptures, you become, it's, 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 it's blatantly obvious that that judgment of God does not fall quickly. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He made man ultimately to have relationship with him. And he, he is at pains to try and accomplish that. And so, for me, summarizing the book of Isaiah, and as we see the way the book of Isaiah pans out, for me that pattern of God just it leaps out. And that pattern of God as well um, is ours. I'm just going to finish by quoting Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 11. Shouldn't be quoting Ezekiel when I'm talking about Isaiah, should I? That's just against the rules. Well, guess what? The same God wrote them all, so I'm going to quote it. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11 says, Say unto them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die? O house of Israel. So there's a fairly short summary of a big book, but I hope for some that just helps lay a foundation to actually look into the awesome details that are uh, enclosed in that wonderful book.